PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder is um, the response an individual has to experiencing or witnessing a terrifying or traumatic event. And symptoms of that can include flashbacks, nightmares, avoiding uh, the stimulus. The symptoms in and of themselves usually start within three months after the traumatic event, um, may not actually appear until years later, but can usually be categorized in four basic categories. That would be the intrusive thoughts, avoidance, emotional um, disturbance, and or um, functional disturbance. You know, changes in the way you think and, and react to certain situations. About seven or eight out of every 100 people, seven to eight percent of the population will have PTSD at some point in their lives. About eight million adults have PTSD during any given year. The U.S. Department of Veterans estimates that PTSD afflicts almost 31 percent of Vietnam vets, as many as 10 percent of Gulf War or Desert Storm veterans, 11 percent of veterans of the war in Afghanistan, and 20 percent of Iraq War veterans. That's an awful lot, you know of our own, of folks that, that uh, were willing to risk everything for us and now, you know, have returned because of the experience that, that has happened. And I think there is a real obligation that any society uh, has to, to, to care for folks. The reality is, is that a significant portion of the United States, you know, Americans are afflicted you know, with traumatic symptoms. Eight million folks will experience a traumatic event this year. That's a significant portion of society. Suicide in general is a significant issue in the population, but with veterans, they tend to have significantly higher rates in terms of 22 veterans a day, one to three active veterans a day. That's quite alarming when you think about the overall numbers. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the stigma that's attached to getting treatment, access to treatment, um, feeling supported. There are two particular modes of treatment that have been proven to be significantly effective for folks with PTSD, especially veterans. And that's cognitive pr processing therapy and prolonged exposure therapy. Both of those should be done with a professional who is trained in those modalities to actually help the individual work through their traumatic experience and be able to come to grips with it. Vets are trained to be stoic in battle, right? Push their emotions aside so that they can remain focused. They're trained to sleep lightly. They're trained to be hypervigilant and know all, all the things that are going on around them. Be able to pick up details in the environment that we may not necessarily pick up as civilians. All of these things that are ingrained in them as soldiers, as warriors, a lot of times don't help them function well when they return to society. So what we end up with is um, folks feeling like they don't really have people that they can turn to. They don't have people that understand what they're experiencing. Being told or described as having a disorder is off-putting to most veterans and, you know, is counterintuitive for them because they're supposed to be in control of everything. So how can I be in control if I have a disorder or, you know, what we like to refer to as the invisible wounds of war. It's really what it is. They're unseen, you know, injuries that the veterans often come home with. The example I always use is, is diabetes, you know, I mean, if you walked into the doctors or you began noticing that you had something was going on, your vision, your this, your that, or the cold sweats or whatever happened, you, you would go to a doctor and you would find out and the doctor says to you, geez, you know, you're, you know, diabetes too and this is what you need to do, um, that you, wouldn't you go do that? You know, we're talking about your very survival. You know, uh, for me, this is no different. 
you know, mind, body, you know, I, I don't draw a distinction between that, you know, so that, you know, if this is what's going on with you, um, you got to get the help that you need for your very survival in a lot of cases. If you're a veteran, a first responder, police officer, um, fireman, EMT, nine times out of ten, doing your job requires you to have a heightened level of adrenaline, causes you to be on a heightened level of awareness. You know, you need to be in control of the situation. So when you return to civilian life, if you will, it tends to be a bit boring. So you're looking for ways to keep that excitement going. You're looking for ways to increase your ability to experience the kinds of things you experienced when you were deployed or, or working. So you turn to you know, the things that can cause that kind of release of chemicals in the brain for yourself. And that may be the drugs, alcohol, gambling, significant risk-taking behaviors. Isolation is, is really a killer, you know? And, uh, you know, we're losing about 22 vets a day through suicide. And a lot of that we find is because of isolation, because of that, you know, lack of uh, primary and social support that keeps people alive, you know, keeps them integrated, keeps them involved. We choose a day to honor our veterans, uh, both living and dead, you know, on Memorial Day in particular uh, for those that have passed. But, but Veterans Day is a day that um, a lot of folks gather and we, and we pay homage to, to folks that have given that sacrifice. It's timely because it's um, Veterans Day, but I think it's definitely something that we need to be aware of throughout the year. These issues aren't limited to those two or three days a year. So it should be something that's in the forefront of our minds. And it's our role, you know, to try and help folks, regardless of what day of the year it is.